Hey guys, it's me, Joey from the future, here to let you know that this video is proudly sponsored by Viz! Whoa! If you clicked on this video, then that means you probably like Jojo, and if you do like Jojo, then Viz is here to satisfy all of your Jojo wants and needs. Like these Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Diamond is Unbreakable manga. Two-in-one release volumes with these beautifully upholstered, hard-covered designs, oh my god. Or if you're not much of a manga reader, then how about the Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Diamond is Unbreakable Part 1 Limited Blu-ray? Which includes the Blu-ray, special booklet, art gallery, English cast interviews, and a whole lot more. So if you want to order, order your way into these amazing Jojo products and a whole lot more, then make sure to check out this by clicking the link in the description below. This video is already long as hell, so I'm gonna go away now. Enjoy the video! <laughs> it's kind of bizarre, no pun intended, to think, but in the time that I spent reading this one manga series, I have flown halfway across the world to attend a convention, then flown halfway across the other side of the world to attend another convention. And now I am here, back home in Australia, with my family reading Jojo. What has this series done to me? Yeah. Hey, how's it going everyone? This is the Anime Man. Do you guys like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure? I do. For those of you who don't know, Jojo's Bizarre Adventure is a Shonen Jump manga written by Araki Hiroshiko back in, I believe, the early 90s, something like that. And it is a series that is still serializing to this day. But regardless of how I think the mediocrity of the Jojo memes recently has diminished to the lowest of levels, me having grown up with Jojo's Bizarre Adventure ever since middle school, it is a, a very big part of my uh, manga reading career. But there's usually one problem when I I try to recommend my friends to start reading Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and that is it's really fucking long. Don't believe me? Let me show you. Now, after seeing this particular image, I think I can safely say that I'm probably the biggest JoJo fan on the internet. JoJo fans, step the fuck up. And because I love JoJo so much, I am on a quest to answer one very simple question. How long does it take to read all of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? Originally, my question was, how long does it take to watch all of something? Like, how long does it take to watch all of One Piece? Or, how long does it take to watch all of Naruto? You know, any- you can name any anime series that has a lot of episodes. But then I thought about it, and the answer was pretty simple. I mean, anime is limited to the amount of time that you can spend on each episode. Usually anywhere between 22 to 25 minutes, if you take away the 5 minute ad break. So all you have to do in the case with, say, One Piece, is to take the number of episodes and multiply it by how long each episode is. But the thing is with manga, it doesn't quite work the same way. Because everybody's reading speeds are different. I may be able to finish the first volume of Jojo in five minutes, and someone else who is not as literate as I am, for example, may possibly take an hour or two hours. So really, the only way that we can find out the answer to how long does it take to read all of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure is, is to just do it, is to just read it all. Now before we start the challenge, let's do some ground rules in case you want to make this an official challenge. Number one, you can take breaks. So the time that it takes to read all of this manga will be the total accumulated time of each reading session. Because with all honesty, with how long these volumes are, I can't possibly sit here for a week straight to just read this manga. As much as I love this series, it is humanly impossible. Rule number two, just so people don't think that I am cheating or anything, I'm obviously going to try and film the entire process, but also because conveniently Jojo's Bizarre Adventure is split up into parts, at the end of finishing each part, I'm going to be giving you a very quick review and analysis of what I thought about that part. And rule number three is have fun. I'm gonna have so much fun with this. In all honesty though, like this was actually a really like convenient and nice little uh, challenge that I decided to put upon myself because I did actually want to reread all of Jojo anyway. Let's see how long it takes to read all of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, starting with the ever infamous Volume 1. Jesus Christ, I'm gonna die. There's a stopwatch right there so that you guys can keep track of the, the time lapse that's happening and uh, yeah, there's not much else that's stopping me now at this point. <laughs> So let's start off at the place that everybody once first stood. I don't know, is it just me or like, does Dio never look like this for the rest of the series? Like, he never looks like this. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. How long does it take to read JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? Starting in five, four, three, two, one. <sighs> Jesus be with me. 
I, man, I forgot that Jonathan just gets absolutely fucked with the inclusion of Dio. Even before, like, the, the, the famous scene, you know, the one I'm talking about, he just gets absolutely, like, his whole life is just completely fucked. There it is, the beginning of every single JoJo meme in existence. Kono Dio da! <laughs> Dude, no wonder, like, this scene still lives on to this day. Like, when it first came out, this scene was fucking powerful, bro. So, so far it's taken me 29 minutes and 31 seconds to read <laughs> volume 1. This is gonna be a long video, isn't it? <laughs> volume 2 is when they, uh, when they first show Speedwagon. He's my favorite character in part 1, I fucking love Speedwagon. Alright guys, I have to go to a birthday party. I'm like halfway through volume 2, I'll remember where I am. 40 minutes of my life with one and a half volumes. God damn. All right, day two. Let's continue where we left off. <coughs> and with two hours and five minutes in, we have completed part one. So my quick review of part one. Well, unlike the traditional Jojo that most people know about, it is Pretty freaking simple. If anything, a lot of it reminds me a lot more of uh, another manga from around the same age, Fist of the North Star, which is one of my favorite manga series out there, uh, alongside of Jojo. First of all, the stands haven't made an appearance yet that everyone knows about. Instead, they use these things called Hamong. You do get to see Jonathan and Dio fighting in really, really cool ways that they don't really use again in later Jojo parts, I feel, especially with the introduction of stands in part three, which I will eventually get to. But yeah, Tsepidi is a really fucking cool character that makes an appearance in this, but unfortunately dies. I wish, like, we could have seen more of him, more of him fighting, because he was just a really, like, classy gentleman. And yeah, we also get to see Speedwagon there as well, which is a recurring character in the rest of the series, which I will talk about when we get to it. So the ending of part one essentially ends with Jonathan and Dio dying in a fire, or at least that's how it is presumed. It took me two hours and five minutes to read four and a half volumes, so uh, just goes to show how long this video is actually going to be. But without further ado, let's begin part two. Hell yeah, I already like part two because the main character's name is Joseph. We're the same. I totally forgot that part two straight up has Nazis in them. Not even like a Nazi-esque type of organization, like just straight up Nazis. I kind of noticed that during the first part, there weren't really a lot of like Jojo poses. There were a lot of like poses, but not like the, the ones that we know in Jojo. But I'd say this is probably like the first example of, even in part two, of a, of a Jojo pose. Oh, uh, this is the scene right here. Eshidishi, one of the three guys in the pillars. He gets his arm chopped off and you think he's gonna get angry, but no. This boy cries like crazy. Now that is a mood if I've ever seen it. <laughs> I found the scene. Nice or nicer. Very nice, Shizo-chan. <laughs> That's how good Jojo phrases are, is that even something as minute as this in the original manga can become a meme. Shizo! It's actually pretty fucking sad though, not gonna lie. And there you go. That's the end of part two. Okay, so my review of part two. This is where things started to get a little bit more on the ridiculous side of the Jojo fan base, where you had uh, characters like Wamu and Kazu. Essentially, they are able to manipulate their like artery movements, they're able to manipulate their bones to turn into like swords and stuff, and it gets pretty fucking insane. If I were to say which one was better, part one or part two, I would definitely say part two, just because we get to see a lot of different connections between different characters that really expand upon generations. And not to mention in part two, they actually try to scientifically explain as much as possible as to the reasons why such powers from different characters work or such battle tactics work. Like they're actually meticulously crafted to make it as realistic as possible in a 
very unrealistic setting that is Jojo, which I think is already a hell of a lot more better and more thought out than part one ever was. I think part one was kind of like a, a trial period to try and figure out like, yeah, this is how it's gonna go. And honestly, it was interesting to just read it. I haven't read Jojo in a very, very long time. So seeing all of these like familiar scenes, obviously, you know, brought me back a wave of nostalgia, but also the other smaller fine details I had completely forgotten about. Like I had completely forgotten about the, you know, how the fight with Eshidishi or even the fight with Wamu as well. Even though Wamu is such a, a known and very, you know, popular character in the Jojo universe, just the fight with Wamu, like on the horses and everything, like that fight scene was pretty fucking dope. I like part two. Part two is also very, very fun. Now we are going to move on to part three. Stardust Crusaders, but I think I'm going to do that tomorrow because it's already midnight now and I've spent like the past five hours today reading Jojo, so uh, I'm gonna go to bed and I'm gonna start part three at another time. So, what else you gonna say? The last couple of days I didn't really have time to read like at all I had to do I'd like to get a bunch of videos finished and everything so today I finally have all day because Aki's out filming for her video so we can finally start fucking part three Jojo that is a Jojo pose and a half I think also from this point on in the video I am going to be hiding or not showing how much time has passed I mean you guys can tell that I'm not fucking faking this shit okay like I'm properly sitting down to read every single thing but I'm going to hide the time from the rest of this video just so that the final result will be a little bit of a mystery for you guys because I also don't know how long this is going to be either. So uh, without further ado, let's read Jojo Part 3 Stardust Crusaders. Jotaro's mom is so freaking cute. I love her. You just go and get a stand and everything. You'll be fine. My mom will always be here to protect you. Best mom. Oh uh, yeah, the introduction of Steely Dan. Uh, I think this is like one of the first times where we start to see a pattern in the Jojo universe of things named after 70s and 80s bands. If you don't know, there's a band called Steely Dan that this is named after, so. So right now I am on volume 20. I talked about this page in a very, very old Jojo video, which I guess I'll leave in the description below. Essentially, there's this whole like conspiracy that this page is like a secret message to 9-11. More information in the video in the description, but man, this has been a while since I've read this page. I love the fact that this derby fight, or the, the derby's younger brother fight, is just them playing video games. Like, how is it possible that seeing two buff dudes playing video games is epic? Only Jojo can do that. Man, Dio was so evil in part one, but in part three, he's just something completely different. He is just absolutely fucked. <sighs> well, there you go, guys. I managed to read all of part three. As you can see, the sun's gone down now. I've literally been doing this all freaking day. Something that took all day for me was probably maybe about two minutes for you guys. So yeah, just, just let that sink in. But yeah, let's do a review of part three. Obviously this is the first part where the stands arrive and you have everything from like obviously, you know, the, the main stuff like the Star Platinum, the Silver Chariot, Halifant Green, all the main ones that can just do literally anything, there's like literally no bounds. To stuff like, you know, turning a body into a magnet or to turn into the size of an atom and en enter someone's bloodstream to control them. So my favorite character for part three is definitely Polnarev. Silver Chariot is one of the coolest looking stands, but just Polnarev as a character is just so wacky and energetic and, you know, he knows when to fuck around, but he knows when to be serious. He's, he's kind of like the Kuabara of uh, Jojo. Part 3 is much longer than part 1 and 2, but there's a whole other level of the Jojo universe that you can experience and have fun with. And as good as part 1 and 2 is, part 3 definitely, so far at least, out of the first three parts, is definitely at my number one spot. And I mean, I'm sure it is for a lot of people as well. I thought about starting just a little bit of part 4, but I mean, part 4 is also going to be really, really long. So I think I'm going to save part 4 for the next day, which will be like one transition away for you guys. So... Oh, I'm gonna try and change up the angle of the videos every day, or at least, you know, every other day, just to make the video a little bit more interesting. So today I'm in front of my computer on a shitty webcam. 
Yeah. So it's been a few days since I read or finished part three. And now we're about to move on to volume 29 part four. I have all day to read this. So hopefully we can knock out part four in a single day. Without further ado, let's begin. Something I've just noticed with Joska's Stan, Crazy Diamond, if you don't know, is a reference to Shine On You, Crazy Diamond, the song by the 70s progressive band Pink Floyd. The ability of Crazy Diamond is that it can destroy things and then put them back together, but Joska can't heal himself with the Crazy Diamond. The song Shine On You, Crazy Diamond was written for former Pink Floyd member Sid Barrett to help him heal his wounds. Even though that song is for Sid, he can't heal himself with it. It just goes to show that like Araki doesn't just like fucking randomly throw in band names with these different stands like he actually thinks about it and he clearly has to have an understanding for the bands and the songs and everything. So props to Araki for that that's super fucking cool. I do have a feeling though that Kishibe Rohan this new character that just came out in part 4 is probably like a personification of Araki Sensei. I know it's, that's probably like the most obvious answer, but I'm sure I'm not the first person to say that. Highway Star has to be one of the creepiest stands I've ever seen. <laughs> Smells with his feet. Oh yeah, I forgot this chapter. How the cat turns into a plant. Like, just saying that out loud is... Araki, how do you think of this shit up? This is just like a perfect panel to show you just how artistic Araki's uh, panels can get. Like that kind of style right there is like, you don't see that in manga anymore. And even back then you didn't really see it, it's just one of a kind. And we're done with part four. Compared to part three, there were some things that I thought were better, some things that I thought were a little bit worse, so let's quickly go over that. Kira Yoshikage is probably my favorite villain in the Jojo universe. They put so much reality into his personality. He has struggles, he has ambitions. The best of him and the, the worst of him are basically just taking him over and making him do some pretty fucked up shit. Like, even when he transformed, into that other guy. He just wanted to live a quiet life, just kind of explore himself, and if people got in the way, then, you know, he unfortunately just had to kill them to defend himself. But other than that, his personality is really unique in the sense that it's very realistic. As much as I like Dio, he does seem like a very, you know, over the top, like, I am the villain and I'm going to destroy the world kind of guy. Whereas Kira Yoshikage is just a very down to earth dude who will basically get his way no matter who tries to stop him for his own happiness. Now, some, I guess, Bad parts or negative parts about part 4 for me was um, just some of the characters in part 4 were pretty annoying, pretty pretty useless I would say. You guys got the Jolski, the, the main Jojo for part 4. I like him because I think it is set more in like a modern time, at least in part 4. He definitely does have a lot more of a, a, a personality that is likable and that is more grounded to the earth. Right at the end, during the final battle of part 4 with uh, Kira, his son or the son of the guy that Kira transforms into, Hayato. He was kind of just there to be like a mediator to the fight. Like his commentary and his dialogue reminded me of like an esports commentator. He was just like commenting on everything that was happening and just happened to know what the hell was going on with everything. He's not even a stand user and yet he knew more about what was going on in the battle than all of these other stand users. It just seemed a little bit of a plot convenience to me. Even like the way that Kira actually does end up getting defeated at the end, which I'm not gonna say in case of spoilers, but especially when you compare it to the first three parts, a little bit anticlimactic. But Killer Queen is a fucking cool stand and super OP stand, but makes a lot of sense. And I just love the Queen reference. And speaking of references, way more references to like old bands. You know, you have uh, Pink Dark no Shonen, which is the manga that Kishibe Rohan was drawing, is clearly a reference to Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. You have stands like, you know, Killer Queen, Highway Star, which is a Deep Purple reference, Red Hot Chili Peppers, which is a reference to Red Hot Chili Peppers. So yeah, you can definitely start to see more of these like band references making a uh, way in. And I love it. I mean, as a dude who loves listening to that kind of music, I freaking love it. So hell yeah. Part four, pretty good. I would still recommend it. Until next time. Where's me? Well, I 
うございます。So it's been five days maybe since the last you saw me, like two seconds ago. And、uh, yeah, a lot has happened. Finally, today I have some time now, so we are going to get started on and hopefully finish JoJo Part 5. Golden Wind, which, as of the recording of this particular part of the video, is the last to be adapted into an anime. Without further ado, let's begin. This is the scene where Butarati licks Dorno's face. It's still a fucking w e e k What was he thinking? If you just look at this page out of context, you just see like a head that's alive being hung up by his eyelids with a fishing rod and then glasses attached to him to burn his eyes, and there's just three dudes in outfits dancing. This page is the perfect, the perfect definition of how fucking weird and awesome JoJo can get. I'm on the notorious BIG stand. I think that's the first like hip hop or like rapper. Name that he has used in a stand because everything else so far, at least in part five, has been some kind of rock band. Even in parts three and four, they've all been rock bands of some kind. I wonder why he chose Notorious BIG. Is he a fan of it? The seven page Muda. <laughs> and then he puts in the re there as well. Oh, look at all those Mudas, bro. And there's the last page. God damn. I can just imagine Araki was just like, you know what? That Muda scene is really fucking dope. Let's just give him seven pages to absolutely destroy his ass. Oh, that has to be one of the coolest fucking panels in part five when he becomes Gordo Experience Requiem, which is a really fun word to say. And we're done. All right, time for my review. Of part 5 Golden Wind. I definitely wouldn't say that part 5 is my absolute favorite. There are certainly a lot of really fantastic moments in part 5, you know, namely character designs are fucking phenomenal. Probably the best out of the first five parts that I have read. These characters just look so epic and cool. And not just character designs, but even stand design as well. Golden Experience in itself is just a really cool looking stand. And I mean, Giorno Giovanna is just. The coolest looking JoJo, in my books at least. Diablo is a villain that you don't really get to fully understand or fully experience the background of. For like 85% of part 5, you don't even know what the guy looks like. And then when you do find out what he looks like, they suddenly do that weird switch with Silver Chariot Requiem, where all of the souls get switched around with other characters. And I mean, it was great to see p o l n a r e v back at it again, because p o l n a r e v was my favorite character in part 3. It's around. Part 5, really, where you really start to see how visually aesthetic and visually creative Araki's art style can get, not just in fight scenes, but also just in the way that characters move and interact with. It was a nice length, not too drawn out in anything, and was pretty freaking good. But yeah, it is like almost midnight here right now. I'm just glad I got to finish. Part five, really. We、uh, just finished, what was it, 63 volumes of JoJo? So, weirdly enough, even though there's only three parts left, we're only like halfway through reading all of JoJo. Holy shit. o h a y o g o z a i m a s I say that, but it's like 5 p.m. A few things have changed.、Uh, for one, I got a haircut. I'm digging it. Let me know in the comments below what you think. I was working all day today, but I figured I should probably start. Reading more of JoJo because I'm kind of running out of time and I really don't want to have to lug a bunch of volumes of JoJo, you know, to America. Today, we're going to be starting JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 6 Stone Ocean. Without further ado, let's begin. Oh, that is just painful to look at. <sighs> After all of that, I'm done with part six Stone Ocean. So let's do a little recap. Definitely my favorite part. I slowly remembered more and more of it as I read it. And、uh, yeah, definitely can say 
hands down my favorite part so far. This is the first time we get to see a female Jojo protagonist named Kujo Jolene, who is the daughter of Kujo Jotaro from part three. And it's set in a prison with uh, a mostly female cast, I would say. Like, it's not until later on that side characters turn into males, but for the majority of the part, like, the, the main people are females, which is really cool. And I'd say, like, you know, pretty different compared to the other parts. But definitely just out of all of the, the Jojos so far, Jolene is definitely just the most badass. Maybe because she is a girl. Her stance, Stone Free, is also just freaking awesome. I love it. And you can definitely see just a huge bump in quality in art style from Araki, even when you compare it to the previous part. And the villain, Enrico Pucci, is actually, again, a very, very good villain. I wouldn't say, again, he's the best villain in Jojo, because, again, as I mentioned in part 5's review, Kira Yoshikage is the best villain in Jojo so far, but I'd say Enrico Pucci is a pretty close second because again, it gave us a lot of time to build up this character. It gave us a lot of time to understand who this character was and especially the fact that he had such a connection, a massive connection to Dio Brando. It's really cool to see that even after all of this time that Dio has been gone, he's still kind of working behind the scenes and fuck the Jojo lineage up as much as he can. The ending as well, like even though it did end up a little bit creepy and a little bit, some might even say anticlimactic, like all the characters came back after the universe had collapsed on top of itself multiple times as different people, but the same people? Again, by the time I'm reading this, uh, part five, the previous part, is the furthest that the anime adaptation has gone, so I'm actually really looking forward to seeing part six being adapted. Like, it's gonna be really interesting to see how part six is gonna be adapted because it's just so much more weird and out there in terms of stand powers, in terms of fights, in terms of just characters and how the characters look. And definitely, part six is another huge reason why it's my favorite is because the character designs are fucking dope. Like, part 5's character designs were fucking fantastic. Part 6, though, we really get to see the ladies shine, and goddamn, Araki can make some really badass, yet somehow sexy ladies at the same time. I don't know how he does it. I think we'll leave it at that. Next part we'll be doing is part 7, Steel Ball Run, which I think also happens to be the longest JoJo part. That one's gonna take a little while longer, but, uh, we'll see how it goes. Oyasuminasai. <sighs> It is the next day, and as you can see from my hair, I just woke up. But today, we are going to be starting part 7, Steel Ball Run. I don't think I'll be able to finish it all in one go today because I have a lot of things to prepare for today, so hence why I am recording this literally first thing in the morning. This is going to be interesting to read, so without further ado, let's begin. Guess who's fucking back? It's motherfucking Dio! What the hell? <laughs> In part 7, there really isn't a concept of stands because it's like way before they discover the stone mask that you see in part 1. But there are some people who have gotten these like stand powers but they don't know what they are. And one of these characters here, uh, he's like a sheriff who has the ability to like throw a rope and then his body goes along the rope, like, he, he can get split up and move along the rope. He doesn't know what to call this power, so he decides to call it a stand, because it is a power that stands up against a curse. So, is that, like, the origin of the word stand? Because I don't think they ever explained it up until part 7 here. Apparently it is because it is a power that stands up to the devil. That's pretty badass. Okay, what the fuck? Dio literally just turned into a dinosaur. <sighs> I love this manga. There's a fantastic reference to uh, the song Johnny Be Good, as Gyro is saying, Go Johnny, go, go, go! I love those, even the subtle references Araki's able to throw in there so effortlessly. Now, you're probably all wondering, Joey, what the fuck happened? First of all, I'm not in my house anymore, as you can probably see. I am in uh, Aki's room in uh, America. Yeah. I'm literally on the other side of the planet right now. For you guys, it literally will be two seconds, but for me, it has been a full five days because uh, jet lag 
jet lag's a thing. But I essentially was saying that I had to read as much of JoJo as I possibly could because I was literally flying out to America the next day. But I was like, fuck, I, uh, I need to read JoJo. And to do that, I need the physical volumes, but I'm going to America, so what the fuck am I gonna do? It's not like I'm gonna take all of the manga onto the actual plane with me and travel it for thousands and thousands of miles across the Atlantic Ocean to the other side of the planet, right? Jokes on you, I actually did that. I brought like 30 or so volumes of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure manga across the Atlantic Ocean because that's how much of a fucking dedicated JoJo fan I am. Araki Sensei, please fucking notice me. So I read the entirety of volume 16, which is currently right here, but None of it came into my head, so I'm not counting that as having read it, because I've read this entire volume and I still didn't understand what the fuck I just read. So hopefully today I'll be able to finish off Steel Ball Run Part 7. But right now we're essentially at the point of the story where Gyro Zeppeli and Johnny Joestar, the Jojo of this part, have uh, just found, I think, the third to last body part of, of, the, of the holy person in question, which uh, so far has been hinted as being Jesus Christ himself. What? Jojo's not about logic, it's about just how fucking, as the name suggests, bizarre and fucking epic that it can possibly be, and so far, it's gotten pretty goddamn epic. For now, let's read the rest of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 7, Steel Ball Run. Here we go. I don't know why, or I don't know if it plays any part in the story, but Gyro just admitted that his real name is not Gyro, but in fact, Julius Caesar Zeppeli. Why? Damn, Jojo is really good at not having plot armor. And I can't say which one it is in this part because of the spoilers, but... God damn. Whoa. I wasn't expecting that, holy shit. <sighs> Alright, here is my review of Steel Ball Run Part 7 JoJo. Art, as always, is fucking fantastic. I think it's actually getting better and better. I mean, I know it's getting better and better because I've been reading it from start to finish. I've noticed with part seven, Araki's really starting to use big panels, like many, many pages where there's an entire scene that is just covering the entire page, or you might even have, you know, as little as two or three panels a page, because I feel that Araki is really starting to incorporate the entire scene rather than focusing on a character's face or, you know, just small little details. In terms of like the Jojo, uh, Johnny Joestar, he was kind of, you know, not as like a badass Jojo as like the previous six Jojos, but definitely a likable Jojo. He definitely had a lot of uh, development throughout the entire thing. He went from this like cowardly dude who could barely stand up to this insanely badass dude who managed to really fuck up Dio, or at least tried to fuck up Dio in the best way that he could. And even though at the end of Steel Ball Run, Dio is technically like the ultimate bad guy, uh, up until that point, uh, the character Funny Valentine, which is hilariously a funny name. He was a great character because, again, you got to see his development. Because Steel Ball Run had so many chapters and so many volumes to really expand upon the story and characters, you really got to see Valentine's character like really get expanded to the point where he did turn into a pretty badass villain. Although I must say the ability to uh, travel through dimensions is getting pretty ridiculous even for Jojo standards. And somehow even an overpowered skill like that, uh, the Jojo lineage just managed to fuck it up somehow because it's Jojo. And I also like the fact that I guess with this particular series, uh, uh, I guess this particular part, they made a lot of references in particular to ACDC, which is a band that I didn't think Araki would know or like in any way, but the last couple of uh, chapters were references to ACDC songs like 
high voltage or even you know Valentine Stand was called Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap which is ACDC's first album. I really enjoyed it. I think it was the perfect length and a perfect conclusion. I still think part six I think so far just overall experience was definitely my favorite but I'd say Steel Ball Run is a is a very close second so far. So yeah next clip you will see of me is me hopefully starting to read part eight Jojolion. Could be five days from now, could be five hours from now for me. Either way for you guys it will be happening in a few seconds so I will uh I'll see you guys then. Yeah. Hi. So it's been about two weeks, I'd say. For starters, I'm not in America anymore. I am in Australia now. And I have also gone through two entire conventions since you last saw me. Anime Expo in LA and Smash in Sydney. Good thing is that we only have 20 volumes left because all we have to do is read part eight. Jojolion, which I have never actually read before, so this is going to be entirely new experience for me reading this. And I realized that Jojolion, as of the recording of this video and most likely the uploading of this video, is still serializing. So I'm going to be reading up to volume 20, which is the latest volume that is currently out. But yeah, soon we will be finished with Jojo. Without further ado, let's read this shit. Wait, hold on. First chapter and immediately a huge bombshell just dropped. Apparently our protagonist, or what I assume is our protagonist, has four testicles. What? Hold on. Apparently this main guy's name is Kira Yoshikage. Like Kira from part four. This is about to get interesting. Oh, okay. The new Jojo is... Kira Yoshikage and somebody else mixed together. I like how they're going back and making all of the connections again to the previous Jojo generations. See, that's like the attention to detail that Araki is really, really good at. One thing I've noticed so far about this part eight is that there are a lot of like fight scenes between stands, but they're not like fully action packed fight scenes like in, you know, parts three to seven. Like a lot of them are kind of psychological battles of like trying to outwit one another, which is a, you know, a nice little change of pace, I would say, definitely. Every time I see this like fruit that they're going after to cure the illness of turning into stone and all of that, I can't help but think of like a devil fruit from One Piece. Just can't get that out of my head. Ah, uh, it finally gets revealed. The Jojo for this part is Kujo Josefumi. So that's really interesting. It's like connecting the Kujo family, the Higashikata family, and the Kira family. That's really complicated all of a sudden. <laughs> Kind of crazy to see uh, Killer Queen again. That was a stand from what four parts ago, so it's kind of weird to see him make a comeback here, even though in a completely different role now, from a, uh, an antagonist to more of a protagonist role. It's 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 kind of a weird progression, but it's weirdly natural and interesting. Yo, okay, I'm just reading volume 17 of Jujolion, we're almost at the end, but two new characters just came out, Urban Gorilla and his Stan Brainstorm, and another character called Dora Mufaso Atido, which is a reference to the 1970s progressive rock band Hawkwind, which is a band that I don't think many people know, but they're one of my favorite progressive rock bands, and the fact that Araki put in a reference to Hawkwind, this man not only has fantastic taste, in art, but also has fantastic taste in music, as if I couldn't love Araki any more than I already do. And we are done. Holy shit. I finally finished Jojolion Volume 20, which is the latest volume as of the recording of this video, which means I have completed the Jojo Challenge. I have read all of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Jesus Christ. 
least I did it. And the time it took me was 43 hours, 54 minutes and 21 seconds. About 44 hours. I thought it would take me at least like 50, 60 hours. I mean, that's 44 hours of just, you know, straight reading. But in reality, it took me like 30 or 40 days at least because I got really, really busy these last couple of months. But yeah, first, let's do a quick review of... Jojolion part 8 so far. One thing I really really like about Jojolion so far is that unlike the other parts of Jojo, there isn't really like a main bad guy or a main antagonist. You don't have a Dio or an Eshidishi or a Kira Yoshikage. Well, I mean, you do have Kira Yoshikage, but he's more of in a protagonist role than an antagonist role. Like, everybody is trying to go for this one goal, which is to get the Dokakaka fruit. And everybody has their own reasonings and developments as to why they want the fruit for themselves. So it's kind of more like a free-for-all than it is a good guy versus bad guy kind of situation, which I believe is one of the first times that the Jojo universe has kind of expanded upon that concept. It's usually been a, a 1v1, good guys versus bad guys kind of concept, which is nothing wrong with because Jojo does it so beautifully well, but I guess it's just a nice little change of rhythm for the Jojo universe. But part 8 protagonist was also pretty cool. I do like his uh, stand soft and wet, uh, which is still a hilarious stand name if you ask me. But even from part 7, the quality of art has just increased dramatically. And as I mentioned earlier, part 8 I feel is a lot more psychology based uh, battles more than they are physical battles. A lot of the enemy stands that come out use kind of psychological tactics to again outwit one another rather than to just kind of brute force it a whole way through. Not to say that the other Jojo enemy stands were using brute force anyway, but this one definitely is a lot more material meticulously crafted and I feel the further we go along in the Jojo universe the more meticulously crafted they get. So volume 20 the latest volume kind of ended on a little bit of a cliffhanger so suffice it to say we have at least a few more volumes to go until this is finished. Again not my favorite Jojo I still have to stand by and saying that part 6 and part 7 are probably my tie for my favorite Jojo parts. For Part 6 and 7 for different reasons are probably my favorite Jojo parts. Overall God damn, this was a long ass video. It's kind of bizarre, no pun intended, to think, but in the time that I spent reading this one manga series, I have cut my hair, shaved my beard, regrown my hair, sh grown back my beard, flown halfway across the world to attend a convention, then flown halfway across the other side of the world to attend another convention. And now I am here, back home in Australia, with my family, reading Jojo. What has this series done to me? But all in all, I had a ton of fun, and this challenge really, for me, has just cemented just how much JoJo is such an absolute adventure, such an absolute ride to go on, especially when you really go from start to finish. But all in all, what I can say, guys, is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is a fucking amazing series. I still would recommend for any of those people who have never read JoJo before to give it a go. Maybe not all in one go like I did, because I'm no one's stupid enough to do what I just did in this video, but maybe take a year, not a month, to... <laughs> Could properly digest all of this amazing manga series. And thanks guys for sticking around to the end of this video. I know this video has probably become crazy long, but uh, hey, you know what? It was worth it because Jojo is worth it. I'm probably not going to be reading manga for quite a while now just because I have a, a lot to process about what the fuck I just read for the past month and a half. If there are any more crazy manga anime challenges that you would like to see me attempt on this channel then leave them down in the comments below also if you have read jojo then what is your favorite part what are your opinions about any of the things that i said in this video and if you've never read jojo would you like to give it a read would you like to give it a watch instead either way let me know all of your opinions and comments down in the comments below anyways guys thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next one like your favorite if you enjoy subscribe for more anime banda keep watching anime Johnny.